Unlike other Christian traditions, uh, Baptists do not point back to one key individual theologian as their founder. Instead, their name recalls the rediscovery of certain elements of a vital New Testament ordinance. And thus, when Baptist emerged in the 17th century in the really the period of the British Civil Wars, which is 1638 to 1651. I, they're sometimes called the English Civil Wars, but they're much larger than that. Uh, they really start in the 16, late 1630s when England gets herself into a, a major squabble with the Scots about the imposition of Anglicanism on the uh, Scottish uh, people. And eventually it would involve Ireland from 1649 onwards. So it's really the British Civil Wars. Uh, when uh, Baptists emerged from the womb of English Puritanism during the British Civil Wars, they insisted that only believers undergo baptism and that it be done by immersion. Most of the main authors who have defended this conviction in that world have been long forgotten. And what is ironic is that the two 17th century authors that are usually frequently brought forward as key Baptists, namely John Bunyan, and uh, Roger Williams uh, really don't fit the mold. Uh, Roger Williams was uh, committed Baptist less than a year. It was kind of a posting on a way to uh, a different ecclesial position, namely that of what, what he called a seeker. And then John Bunyan didn't believe uh, believers' baptism was necessary for entry into the Baptist community, and that really put him outside the fold in some respects. We're going to hear more about that uh, later uh, tomorrow night when uh, uh, Steve Weaver speaks about the uh, controversy between uh, William Kiffin and John Bunyan on uh, the whole issue of communion and membership. This year, though, because it's uh, uh, 2016 and the 400th anniversary of the birth of William Kiffin, we have the opportunity to remember somebody who probably was the central figure in the emergence of the Baptist community, the particular Baptist community, the Calvinistic Baptist community, who Abel was able to shape it, and that shape really persisted down well into the 19th century. When Joseph Ivamy, the 19th century Baptist historian, published The Life of Kiffin in, in 1833, uh, it was the first real life of Kiffin that had been published. It's part of this rediscovery that we were touching on in the Q&A and the uh, last hour of uh, the rediscovery of Puritans. Uh, Ivamy did so in the conviction that the 17th century Baptist leader, quote, was one of the most extraordinary persons whom the Calvinistic Baptist denomination has produced, both as to the consistency and correctness of his principles and the eminence of his worldly and religious character, end of quote. Ivamy especially hoped that his account of Kiffin's life and ministry would spur younger Baptists in his day to use Kiffin as, quote, a pattern of piety and integrity, end of quote. Uh, to what degree this, was, this hope was realized in that day, we can't pursue here. But in the more than a century and a half between Ivamy's day and the present, Kiffin's remarkable life, which he hoped would become better known, has, I think, become increasingly less known. And pretty well the only people today who talk about uh, William Kiffin are not Baptists at all, but a few scholars, and uh, I think very helpful leading the kind of recovery of Kiffin's contribution as being the man who should have been speaking at this hour, uh, Larry Kreitzer, who is a PhD from Southern, a New Testament PhD, uh, at some point in the last 20 years, got interested in uh, Baptist history and has uncovered absolutely reams of material on William Kiffin. Uh, he has four volumes that he's published of papers and uh, articles on Kiffin, his own. Uh, runs to about uh, probably 1,200 pages. He says he's got four more volumes uh, to publish. It's not, a def it's not a life of Kiffin, but it's just an enormous amount of primary, secondary source material that anybody writing a life would need to use. So, uh, Kiffin then, looking at his life and his significance. Kiffin was born in London in 1616 of unknown parents. Uh, his father's roots probably lay, like uh, Owen, in Wales, but probably at some point distant in the past. Kiffin is a Welsh name. Both of his parents uh, apparently died in 1625 during an outbreak of the plague. This is probably uh, the bubonic plague that was 
sweep through Europe, uh, the, ma uh, the uh, significant impact of the plague was mentioned earlier in the paper by Dr. Bucher on uh, Richard Baxter, 1664-65, uh, massive impact, uh, devastation by the plague, but there had been uh, waves of it coming before them. Uh, both of his parents seemed to have died in 1625, and so he was orphaned at the age of nine, and following their death was apprenticed uh, uh, to a glover, that is, a person not simply working with gloves, but probably leather goods, and so he would have been uh, uh, to, uh, skilled and trained in how to make various types of leather work. He would eventually become, he would eventually join the worshipful company of leather workers or leather sellers, which we'll touch on later. There seems to be no truth in the common assertion that he served as an apprentice to John Lilborn, a well, a well known to history as an agitator for the social radicalism of the levelers. The levelers were one of the radical groups that appeared in the context of the British Civil Wars, demanding the destruction of the aristocracy, uh, the parceling up of all their land, etc. And there is some connection between uh, Kiffin and uh, Lilborn. Kiffin writes a, uh, a preface uh, to one of uh, uh, Lilborn's works. And so there is some connection. A lot of the, I'm not going to develop this at great length, but one of the uh, critical things about uh, Baptists in this period of time, a lot of them had radical political connections. They either were radically radical political, politically political radicals, or they had friends who were so. And that also didn't help their cause. In 1631, depressed about his future prospects as a glover, he decided to run away from his master. And in the providence of God, he happened to go by St. Antholin's Church, where the Puritan Thomas Foxley was preaching that day on the fifth commandment and happened to illustrate it with the duty of servants to masters. Seeing a crowd of people going into the church, Kiffin decided to join them. As had been the experience of many under the Spirit anointed preaching the Word, Kiffin was convinced Foxley's Foxley sermon was intentionally directed at him. Uh, I mean, there's no way. I mean, Foxley wouldn't have known who Kiffin was. It was well attended. Uh, he didn't know Kiffin was going to choose that Sunday to run away from his master, uh, etc., etc. But obviously the Spirit of God was orchestrating things and bringing him into the church at that point. And he was brought under conviction and he decided to go back to his master with the resolve to hear regularly some of them they call Puritan ministers. Over the next couple of years, Kiffin heard a number of well-known Reformed ministers of the day, men like John Davenport or Louis Dumoulin. Uh, Louis Dumoulin was the son of a very well-known French Huguenot, a man named Pierre Dumoulin, a very, very significant theologian in France. But it was the preaching of the Arminian, interestingly enough, John Goodwin, uh, that was eventually used to bring Kiffin to Christ. The preaching of all of these men, uh, John Goodwin's an Armini uh, uh, though Arminian, he's a Puritan, uh, very rare to find Arminians who are Puritans, but he was. The preaching of all of these Puritan figures gave Kiffin a firm grounding in the central themes of Puritan theology and spirituality. Here is his comment on a sermon he heard Davenport preach on 1 John 1 7, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. He showed the efficacy of the blood of Christ, both to pardon and to cleanse from sin, and answered objections which the unbelieving heart of man brings against that full satisfaction which Jesus Christ had made for sinners. I found many of them were such as I had made in my own heart, such as the sense of unworthiness and willingness to be better before I could come to Christ for life, with many other of the like kind. This sermon was of great use to my soul. I thought I found my heart greatly to close with the riches and freeness of grace which God held forth to poor sinners. I found my fears to vanish and my heart filled with love to Jesus Christ. I saw sin viler than ever and felt my heart more abhorring it. Toward the close of that year, Kiffin joined a small group of fellow apprentices and they would meet together in the early morning for prayer, scripture reading, and mutual encouragement. Uh, if, if there is anything that is his theological education, this is it. Uh, that and the sermons he heard. Uh, like many Baptist ministers of the day, uh, which some of their Anglican 
and Presbyterian uh, contemporaries reviled, uh, many, many of these men were uh, lower middle class artisans and uh, without formal theological education at all. According to Kiffin, he and his friends would, in his words, meet together an hour before service, that is on, Monday, on a Sunday morning. They would spend it in prayer and in communicating to each other what experience we had received from the Lord or else to repeat some sermon we, which we had heard before. After a little time, we also read portions of Scripture and spake from it what did please God to enable us, wherein I found very great advantage and by degrees did arrive at some small measure of knowledge. I found the study of the Scriptures very pleasant and delightful to me. This passage admirably displays the way in which Kiffin was prepared theologically and spiritually to lead a Calvinistic Baptist congregation for nearly 60 years. Like most of the early Calvinistic Baptist leaders, Kiffin did not have a formal theological education. He became skilled in the knowledge and use of the Scriptures as he first regularly listened to the preaching of the Word and shared it with others, its impact on his life, and finally preached it himself. During the 1630s, the Puritans, the radical element within the Church of England, they're seeking to reform the Church of England, uh, totally according to the Word of God, came under extreme pressure to bring their thinking and behavior into line with the views of William Laud, who had become Archbishop of Canterbury in 1633. Laud was strongly Arminian in his theology, as well as being firmly convinced that the ritual of the Church of England, such things as wearing vestments by ministers, the or, uh, orientation and ornamentation of the communion table. Uh, at the time of the Reformation, the communion table, which used to be at the far end of the east wall of the church, every church in England during the Middle Ages, and they're using medieval churches, was always built on an east-west axis. And so when you prayed and worshiped, you prayed towards Jerusalem. Um, and uh, the table would be at the far end, and during the medieval worship service, uh, the priest would stand with his back for a lot of the service to the people, acting really by the kind of physical posture and the architectural positioning of the table as a mediatorial figure between the congregation and God. At the time of the Reformation, the table was brought uh, out from the east wall, and the minister normally would stand uh, behind, or at, uh, behind the table, or at the side of the table frequently, to indicate that this was now a gathering of the people of God together around the table, and the minister wasn't playing any sort of mediatorial role. And uh, what uh, Laud did, he insisted the table had to be moved back to the east end of the wall, or the east wall. Uh, he insisted on other things, like the use of the sign of the cross in the baptismal service, uh, the use of the apocrypha in uh, readings, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, the use of the ring in wedding ceremonies. Uh, the Puritans rightly knew that the wedding rings have pagan Anglo-Saxon origins. I've got no problem wearing the wedding ring, but they lived a lot closer to those pagan origins than we do. And he was convinced that all these extra adiaphora had the full approval of God. And he sought to impose such uniformity of ritual and doctrine in the Church of England. And he refused to make, this is the critical thing, he refused to make any allowance for the individual conscience. Rather than conform, a goodly number of individuals left England, either for the Netherlands, which was a haven of religious toleration, or for New England, what Oliver Cromwell, William Kiffin's contemporary, called a howling wilderness. No offense if you're from New England. Others, though, refused to quit their homeland and either formed or joined what the Church of England regarded as illegal conventicles. Amongst them was William Kiffin. By 1638, Kiffin had come to reject Anglican arguments for the idea of a state church and had joined what he once termed, quote, a company of saints in a congregational way in London. A number of the quotes that I've got through the paper uh, come from Kiffin's occasional writings uh, which were in prefaces to a variety of books. And in fact, one of the, the freebies given to conference registrants is a little kind of collection of those uh, prefaces. All of them except for one have never been reprinted, which again I think indicates something of uh, Kiffin's uh, uh, lack, of being, uh, lack of notoriety in the history of the church. By 1638 then, Kiffin had come to reject Anglican arguments for the idea of a state church, 
and he had joined a congregational body. When he joined the congregation, it was without a pastor. Its pastor had been a man named Samuel Eaton, who had belonged to a very famous church called the Jacob Lathrop Jesse Church, which is really the mother church of Calvinistic Baptists. When Kiffin joined the church, Eaton was in prison and would die the following year. Kiffin accepted an invitation to preach to the congregation. It would become known as Devonshire Square Baptist Church. It no longer exists. It died out in the late 19th century in the Victorian era. But uh, when Kiffin joins, uh, he becomes the first preacher after Samuel Eaton, and then in three or four years was called to be the pastor. During this entire period, Kiffin continued to study the Bible with direction for direction with regard to the constitution and form of a local church. Over 40 years later, he would recall this period of his life. What stuck out in his memory was this, his diligent examination of the Bible to find the right way of worship. What is common to all of the Puritans, although they will differ on the, the exact details of it, what is common to all the Puritans is that there is in the New Testament a blueprint of worship and a blueprint of ecclesiology. It was the rare Puritan who didn't feel he could find that there. They obviously differ in what exactly that blueprint looks like, ranging from uh, Presbyterian with more formal, uh, formal order over to the Baptists, whose order was somewhat looser. By the fall of 1642, he and his congregation had arrived at what they believed to be such a blueprint, namely what would later be described as a Baptist congregation. He wrote about this search in these years in his sober discourse of right to church communion. That's really the only major book he ever wrote. That appeared in 1681. Uh, Dr. Weaver will touch on that tomorrow night. He said this, After some time I concluded that the safest way was to follow the footsteps of the flock, namely that order laid down by Christ and his apostles and practiced by the primitive Christians in their times which I found to be that after conversion, they were baptized, added to the church, and continued in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer, according to which I thought myself bound to be conformable. If you know the passage that he's referring to, it's Acts 2, 42 and following. And he basically takes that as a, 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 not simply a description of early Christian life, but a prescription for how church life should be done today. You are converted, you are baptized, you then join as a member of a local uh, congregation, and the other things follow. Two years later, he was a signatory for this church, along with the leadership of six other London Baptist congregations. By this point, there are seven particular Baptist churches or Calvinistic Baptist churches in London, and they drew up a confession of faith called the First London Confession of Faith. It was drawn up basically as a response to various slanders against Baptists, slanders that included Baptists are into revolutionary practices. Uh, the reality is some of them did have radical leanings, uh, but the revolutionary practices in mind were uh, the people thought that came to their, their minds were those horrific events of the early 1530s in the town of Munster uh, near the Dutch-German border in which a man named John of Leiden took over the town, declared himself king, uh, declared anybody who wouldn't be baptized as an adult would be executed, uh, instituted polygamy, and uh, it was a complete schmozzle. It was put down by Roman Catholic authorities after much bloodshed after a year. And from that point on, to be an Anabaptist, or to be a Baptist, was to be a one committed to the revolutionary overthrow of the order of the state. And so that was one of the charges. Uh, another charge was that uh, Baptists, these particular Baptists, were into uh, Arminian doctrine. That's uh, almost definitely a confusion with the uh, general Baptists of, uh, associated with John Smith. And thirdly, they were actually into indecent acts when they baptized people. As a, a good number of people thought they knew they were wrong, uh, when Baptists baptized men and women, they it was said that they baptized them in the nude. And uh, there was a very scurrilous attack on Baptists by a man named Daniel Featley, who should have known better, and he had a very racy picture on the frontispiece about a baptism that he purported uh, was taking place. And so these were charges that were laid out against Baptists. Uh, Baptists, uh, the, the whole practice of believer's baptism by immersion was scandalous. 
and it continues to be scandalous well into the late 19th century. Late 18th century, sorry. And so this confession was drawn up basically to show the solidarity of the Calvinistic Baptists with the Reformed community throughout Europe, but it also spelled out in some detail a Baptist ecclesiology. Saving faith was described as an evangelical fruit birthed by the preaching of the gospel or the word of Christ, which is a common conviction to everybody who is Reformed at that point in time. And yet the local church was defined this way. It was, quote, a company of visible saints called and separated from the world by the word and spirit of God to the visible profession of the faith of the gospel, being baptized into that faith and joined to the Lord and each other. Here, what's critical is believers' baptism is understood as the visible display of conversion. You're not baptized as an infant uh, in the hopes that you'll eventually uh, embrace what was pledged at that point in time by godparents, but that baptism here is a way of displaying conversion. It follows conversion. And it's also noteworthy that he makes believers' baptism not inconsequential to the corporate piety of the local church. This is not just an individual act. It is part of a, of a, of a corporate experience, an ecclesial experience. Uh, obviously, there were some Baptists, and we'll see this again tomorrow night, that differed from that. John Bunyan has a very, very different view. This confession is a very important confession. It served as the theological basis for the Calvinistic Baptists during their rapid advance through the British Isles and Ireland in the late 1640s, 1650s. Uh, beginning with seven churches in London in 1644, by 1660, they had about 130. Uh, in England, Wales, Ireland, and maybe one in Scotland. For some reason, Scottish soil proved impervious to the Baptist message, and it would not be till the late 18th century that Baptists begin to make any sort of impact in Scotland. And even then, uh, Scottish Baptists have always been very small. The Confession was reprinted a number of times in this period. Interestingly enough, it was reprinted in Leith in 1653. I was interested in one of the works of Owen was printed in Leith. It would be interesting to know if the, the printer was the same man. Uh, there can't be many printers in Leith, which is a small little port at that point uh, that would have been printing this sort of literature. So maybe it was the same printer. And then throughout the years of persecution in the 1660s and 1670s after the restoration of the monarchy, which we've already uh, looked at. It would be replaced as a confession in uh, the 1680s by what is known as the Second London Confession, which is of very great importance to this school because the Second London Confession, you may or may not know, if you don't know, you now know, uh, is the basis for the Abstract of Principles, uh, which is the statement of faith of our school here and also the statement of faith of uh, Southeastern. During the late 1640s, 1650s, Kiffin emerged as a skilled spokesman for the fledgling Baptist movement. A number of texts record public debates, either proposed or actual, with a number of individuals of varying ecclesial convictions. And I've given a, a number here. This is only a selection. On December the 3rd, 1645, Kiffin, along with two fellow Baptists, Benjamin Cox, Hansard Knowles, was supposed to have debated the London Presbyterian Edmund Callamy the Elder, very well-known uh, gifted preacher. Uh, and they were going to debate it, uh, it was going to be a public debate at his home about the nature and subjects of baptism. The debate was canceled when the Lord Mayor of London, Thomas Adams, uh, heard that there were rumors the Baptists were going to bring, quote, swords, clubs, and staves, uh, which would be a type of club, and they were going to kill Calamy if they lost the debate. Uh, these were uh, groundless rumors, and he canceled the debate, then uh, the Baptists went ahead and published what they would have said if they'd gotten a chance to say it. So that's how we know something of the, the nature of what uh, they would have said on that occasion. In 1646, Kiffin and Knowles were involved in a public debate in Coventry with two other Pado Baptists, John Bryan and Obadiah Grew. Another debate was held with a celebrated court physician. This is a man who had served as a physician to the king of England, Charles I, Peter Chamberlain. Uh, he was a Seventh-day Baptist, so uh, this was a debate on which is the appropriate day for the Lord's uh, worship to take place. Is it on the Lord's Day, or is it on, as he claimed, Chamberlain, the, the Saturday? And, uh, oh, sorry, I, I, that also debate involved also the laying on of hands. Hostile witnesses from this period also point to Kiffin's leadership among the Baptists. The Presbyterian merchant, Josh, 
Joshua Rycraft, uh, tagged him as the grand ringleader of the Baptists, while an anonymous publication, I love this one, Uh, from 1659, has the unforgettable description of Kiffin as, quote, the ordained mufti of all heretics and sectaries. The mufti was the head imam of Jerusalem. Uh, So how uh, Kiffin gets associated with a Muslim imam is anybody's guess. It's probably, obviously, a put-down, but it's, it's a really kind of unforgettable description of the ordained mufti of all heretics. Kiffin also played a prominent role in the expansion of the movement beyond London. Extant documents from places as far afield as Wales or Northumberland, Ireland, and Midlands reveal Kiffin's involvement in the planning, the establishment of new churches, associations, giving them advice and counsel. He traveled widely during this period of time, generally providing stability to the Baptist cause during these early years of the movement. Now, he's traveling. It's civil war. And there will be battles here and there, and sieges here and there, and he's seeking. This is what's so amazing about this period, is that in the midst of complete, absolute turmoil, uh, Kiffin's got a higher vision, which is the establishment of the kingdom. All through this time, Kiffin and many of his fellow Calvinistic Baptists were strong supporters of the rule of England, Oliver Cromwell. Uh, Kiffin knew Cromwell, uh, loved him in many respects, was firmly supportive of Cromwell, and the Cromwellian regime. This was out of loyalty what they saw as the God-ordained authorities, satisfaction with Cromwell's policy of toleration, and a deep-seated fear of anarchy. There were, however, a number of Calvinistic Baptists, especially some in the army in Ireland, who were highly vocal in their criticism of Cromwell. Kiffin, John Spilsbury, and Joseph Sansom wrote to their Irish Baptist brethren in January 1654, urging them this way, to consult with that blessed rule of truth which you profess to be your guide which is the Bible. For that expresses no other thing to Christians but exhortations to be subject to all civil powers. That is interesting, given the fact that they've just had a civil war and overthrown the king, but be that as it may. They being of God, and to pray for all that are in authority, that under them we may live a godly and quiet life in all godliness and honesty. This letter by Kiffin, Spilsbury, and Samson was especially critical of what has been termed the Fifth Monarchy Movement a group of individuals who believed that the prophecies of Daniel 2 were going to be literally fulfilled in their lifetime, and that Christ's millenarian kingdom was shortly to be established. While one wing of the Fifth Monarchy Movement was moderate, nonviolent, and made up of what one writer has described as harmless Bible students, others had definite revolutionary tendencies and were convinced that they should take an active, even violent role in the fulfillment of the prophecies of Daniel and uh, they especially had lost all faith in Cromwell and basically wanted to overthrow him. Open and widespread adherence to these views would have had harmful repercussions for the Baptists. And seeking to counteract the influence of the Fifth Monarchists on the Irish Baptists, the latter was urged, the latter were urged, the Irish Baptists were urged by Kiffin, Spilsbury, and Sanson Sans, 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 to reflect upon the fa- fact that the Calvinistic Baptists in the British Isles had a marvelous opportunity to, quote, give a public testimony in the face of the world that our principles are not such as they have been generally judged by most most men to be, which is, we deny authority and would pull down all magistrate. Another critical moment came in May of 1658, when at the meeting of the Western Association of Baptist Churches in Dorchester, Dorset, some individuals who are sympathetic to the subversive politics of the Fifth Monarchy Movement sought to convince the representatives of the churches of the association to publicly espouse the ideals and goals of this party. Kiffin was present with other representatives from the churches in London, and he successfully persuaded the Western Association not to commit itself in this direction. Now, during all these years of religious political upheaval, Kiffin was also extensively engaged as a merchant, as a le- uh, using his trade as a leather worker uh, to enormous great effect. He had joined the worshipful, com- worshipful Company of Leather Sellers of London. This was company was founded in the middle of the Middle Ages. It had a monopoly on the leather trade in the British Isles. And uh, so this was a significant possibility for uh, Kiffin, which, as we will see, he was able to take advantage of. A decision around 1645 to take a member of his church as a partner for a trading venture in Holland turned out to be the launching of an enormously successful business. In his own words, it pleased God so to bless our endeavors 
that from scores of pounds, he brought it to many hundreds and thousands of pounds. Uh, you need to know in this period of time, probably the average, average annual wage is maybe 20 pounds, 25 pounds. It's very difficult trying to comp compute uh, what did a pound mean now and what does a pound then mean now. It's very much more helpful in saying, okay, what, 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 is, what is an annual wage? An annual wage is maybe 20, 25 pounds in that period of time. In later years, giving me more, he says, of this world than ever I could have thought to have enjoyed. In later years, it would appear the focus of Kiffin's ventures was the cloth trade. His ventures eventually led to the, his involvement in the civic and political affairs of the capital. In 1642, along with other individual Londoners, Kiffin contributed horse and riders for the parliamentary chorus. He, in other words, he, he basically bought the horses and supplied all the goods for riders on them, namely for cavalry. Documents from the late 1650s speak of Kiffin as a captain and then a lieutenant, is the way I would normally say it, but a lieutenant colonel in the London militia. In Oliver Cromwell's last parliament in 1656-1658, Kiffin sat as a member of parliament for Middlesex and was on very good terms with Cromwell. With the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, though, his involvement in political and civic affairs became understandably curtailed, but he's still going to have influence because he's a, he's a multi-millionaire, as we will see. Uh, very rare for a church to have a pastor as a multi-millionaire. From the point of, once he started making money, the church never paid him a salary which would be probably very good for the church in some respects. I'm, that's not a recommendation. <laughs> if any of you are on church committees thinking about uh, pastor's salary, that's, I'm not recommending that. In February 1659, shortly before the restoration of the army, Kiffin's house was raided. Uh, by this point, uh, Cromwell dies in 1658 on September the 3rd, which is the famous anniversary of two of his great victories, the Battle of Dunbar and the Battle of Worcester. And um, uh, his, he wanted his son, Richard Cromwell, to take over. Richard Cromwell was not really the same person as his father, had no interest in running the country, and the country began to slip into anarchy. Various of the generals who had fought, the Puritan generals who had fought against the king, began to take control of local areas. Uh, I hesitate to compare it to Syria, but it was a mild, mild version of this kind of breakdown of government, central government authority and local government authorities were seizing power. And one of the great generals was George Monk, who was stationed in Scotland. He had formed a, a, a regiment called the Coldstream Guards, which still exists today, one of the great British regiments. And he marched his regiment all the way from Scotland down to London, seized the, basically political control in London, and began to uh, uh, consolidate rule throughout England, and came to the conviction that they needed to invite back from the continent Charles I's son, Charles II, and restore the monarchy. And so they began to crack down on known political radicals in the capital, and William Kiffin had those connections, and so his house was raided. Uh, we actually have a broadsheet of the raid because Kiffin was very upset that his house was raided, and he wrote a, uh, a, uh, a reprimand to Monk as to why his house was raided. And they, according to the, the raid, they found uh, Kiffin was arrested. They found two drums five old pikes and six swords, which doesn't sound like he'd be able to much to start a, rebel, a rebellion of any sort. But a number of his friends who were raided, they found sometimes quantities of uh, blunderbusses. And really, you only need one or two blunderbusses. These are the equivalent of shotguns. And one guy had about seven or eight blunderbusses, which people were concerned. Why would you have seven or eight shotguns and whatever? He was soon released, the result of a letter he'd written to the Lord Mayor, Again, his money is playing a role here. Uh, but he had experienced a foretaste of the next 28 years in which the dissenters, those, ecclesi those whose ecclesial convictions led them to leave the Church of England, were brutally persecuted. And we've already heard something of that with the experience of John Owen. Over the next three years, Kiffin was rearrested at least three times, though his stays in prison were very brief. He may have sometimes stayed overnight, once or twice, that compares quite differently from Baxter, 18 months, uh, or John Bunyan, who we'll have a debate with 12 years at one point. But Kiffin did use his position and wealth to good, good cause. Uh, he was rich towards God. 
He often would use it on behalf of dissenters who were imprisoned. In 1664, for instance, he was able to rescue 12 general Baptists from Aylesbury, Buckinghamshire. They'd been sentenced to death for uh, meeting as just a Bible study. They'd been caught. An old Elizabethan law had been used, and they were going to be hung, and he was able to go to the authorities, pay money to get them freed. When Kiffin was informed of the plight of these individuals, he went directly to Charles II, the king who had been restored to the monarchy, and obtained for him a reprieve for all of them. The following decade, he also used his influence at court to clear some New England Baptists from the false charge of murdering a Boston minister. Uh, the rumor had gone around some a Boston minister had been found murdered. It was the Baptists that did it. They were arrested, and it was all gained false, and he was able to use his influence. This is all the way across the Atlantic. There is a very quaint account of Kiffin's influential relation with the king found in a story related by the 18th century Baptist historian Thomas Crosby. The king was always in debt. He was a known spendthrift, uh, never had enough money. Uh, he loved, he was an ardent consumer of all kinds of goods and got himself in all kinds of financial difficulties. And so on one occasion, he's got a massive debt and he asks a number of political figures in London to help him out with it. They were very slow to help him. And according to the, the story, the king had uh, asked Kiffin, eventually resorted to Kiffin, could he give him a loan of 40,000 pounds? Remember, average salary is around 25 pounds a year. So you can do the arithmetic. Kiffin was aware that if he gave the king such a loan, every likelihood it would never be repaid. So he'd lose 40,000 pounds. So he offered to make the king a gift of 10,000, which the king gladly accepted. Afterwards, according to Crosby, uh, Kiffin jocosely remarked that he had thereby saved himself 30,000 pounds. <laughs> That's the, the story. It's a great story, but it is rooted in fact, but it's probably not as, as uh, kind of uh, humorous as, as the story makes it out. The story may well be an infl inflated recollection of an incident in the summer of 1670 when a financially burdened monarch approached the magistrate of London for a loan of 60,000 pounds. I mean, it's an enormous amount of money. Like, what, what had he gotten himself into? He needs 60,000 pounds. Uh, the aldermen of London, these are all the, the councillors, the political figures, they, they was very half-hearted. Uh, they raised only a third of the needed loan. Seeing an opportunity to drive a wedge between the king and parliament, the London dissenters organized the raising of the other two-thirds. Kiffin subscribed 3,600 pounds. That was a gift. And still, you know, that, that is an enormous amount of money. It's, yeah, I get, as I say, you can get into the arithmetic. In 1670, Kiffin was elected sheriff of London in Middlesex, though he was subsequently rejected because of his being a nonconformist. The following year, on July the 7th, he was elected master of the Levicellers. This was extraordinary, since Kiffin was only a liveryman at the time, and normally the master was chosen from the court of assistance, which was a step above the livery. This is typically kind of medieval hierarchicalism at work here. In March 15, 1672, a declaration of indulgence was issued by Charles. He uh, was hoping to gain support from some of the dissenters, and he gave the dissenters opportunity to have liberty to worship and preach, as long as they registered with the state. And Kiffin secured a license for himself to preach, and although the declaration was withdrawn the following spring, there seems to be liberty enough in London for a number of years afterwards for Kiffin to participate in a major public debate with the most radical group, well, probably the most radical group that the Baptists and the Puritans had to deal with, namely the Quakers, uh, there is a big question about whether the Quakers are Puritans or not. None of the Puritans would regard the Quakers as Puritans. I tend to follow the, the kind of morphology of uh, Geoffrey Nuttall, a great historian in the 20th century, where he sees the Puritans as kind of the tail end of, uh, sorry, he sees the Quakers as kind of the tail end of Puritanism, because uh, many of the Puritan in Quaker interests were those of the Puritans. Uh, the interest in the Holy Spirit, that was typically Puritan. And that was typically Quaker. Anyway, Kiffin had a public debate with the Quakers regarding the divinity of Christ on August the 28th and October the 9th, 1674, at the Barbican Meeting House. This is a Baptist meeting house. And on October the 16th, at the Quaker Meeting House. Uh, the second of these meetings lasted all day. It was dark uh, before they finally gave up. 
at the, the at, 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 and at that, and there was a third meeting. There were so many in the audience, there were fears the gallery was going to collapse. Uh, galleries which were not always built well sometimes did collapse. There's a great story of Richard Baxter one time preaching, and uh, the place was jammed, probably about a thousand people. And suddenly, in the middle of the meeting, they heard a huge crack. The main supporting beam of the gallery had actually cracked in half. Uh, it didn't give way until after the meeting, thankfully. But it w- if it had done so before the end of the meeting, it would have been great loss of life. In October 1676, Kiffin and four other London Baptist leaders traveled down to the West Country to confront the Baptist evangelist Thomas Collier. Originally a member of Kiffin's church in London, Collier became the leading Calvinistic Baptist evangelist in southwestern England during the 1650s. Again, it gives you some idea. This man, as we'll see, has begun to deviate from Orthodox Christianity. Uh, Kiffin's the man who's chosen to go down and confront him. Gives you some idea of Kiffin's leadership. Uh, In 1670, Collier had published a book called A Body of Divinity, in which he denied original sin, argued that Christ died for all men, maintained that Christ's humanity was eternal. That is, when Christ came from heaven, He brought His humanity with Him. He did not receive His humanity from the Virgin Mary, which is an old Anabaptist. uh, uh, Some Anabaptists had argued that in the 16th century. Collier's important standing within the Calvinistic Baptist community made it imperative his views be dealt with. A meeting was accordingly arranged between Collier and Kiffin and the other Baptist pastors from London. At the meeting, Kiffin took the lead in urging Collins to re- Collier sorry, to renounce his view- the views that the London Baptist teacher leader obviously regarded as heretical. Collier refused to do so. And Kiffin and the London Baptist leadership subsequently refused all association with him. A year later, when Nehemiah Cox, the son of Kiffin's old friend Benjamin Cox, published a rebuttal of Collier, which is Windicii Veritatis, or a com- computation of the gross heresies and errors asserted by Thomas Collier, Kiffin signed a prefatory statement with five other London Baptists as to why the work was necessary. Collier's heart, in the eyes of Kiffin and his friends, was, quote, not established with grace, end of quote. And he thus became the propagator of teacher, teaching in which, quote, the principles of gospel truths were subverted, the name of God blasphemed, and a floodgate of error opened. Kiffin and his fellow London Baptists were careful to stress it was verity, not victory, namely victory over Collier, that was contended for in this refutation of Collier. In the 1670s, early 1680s, Kiffin was embroiled in yet another controversy, this time with the quintessential Puritan John Bunyan, over the necessity of believer's baptism. Bunyan's A Confession of My Faith and a Reason of My Practice, 1672, he issued this when he was released from prison, and he had just been called to be the pastor of the Bedford Church. And differences in judgment about water baptism, no bar to communion, 1673, had rejected the standard Calvinistic Baptist argument that believers' baptism must precede membership in the local church or any of the privileges of that membership, in particular participation in the Lord's Supper. While there were other written responses to Bunyan, it is Kiffin's A Sober Discourse of Right to Church Communion, published in 1681, characterized by clear logic and crisp presentation, which is the most noteworthy advocacy of the closed membership position in the controversy. Uh, Kiffin, I think, in the debate, Kiffin won the debate, uh, which meant that Calvinistic Baptists in England and America were committed to closed communion and closed membership, obviously, all the way down into the late 19th century. If Bunyan had won the debate, I, I love thinking about counterfactual history. What if? Uh, I have colleagues who think that that's just kind of nonsense and I shouldn't waste my time on it. But I, I love the idea of what if? If, what, if we, I'd be interested to write an article, what if Bunyan had won the debate and his had become the dominant position? If you know anything about the, the history of Bunyan's church, it, it didn't remain exclusively Baptistic. It, and ended up becoming a mixed uh, congregation. Anyway, that's all what if and off to the side. Um, <clears throat> Bunyan summed up, or Kiffin summed up the essence of his argument this way. It's, this is in one of the prefaces uh, that uh, was uh, published in that little, little booklet we handed out. Communion with all saints in all things is a desirable thing, and not the least part of that glory which will forever be enjoyed in heaven. <laughs> 
And it would be a blessed thing if while Christians differ in their light, that is, their light about things in this world on, on non-essential issues, the best, knowing but in part, a reflection of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 12, it might be made up by an increase of love. This would convince the world they were Christ's disciples indeed. In other words, he's saying here, loving communion between believers despite their differences over non-essential issues or secondary issues, it, is, it, it would be something that if we could achieve it here in this world, it would be fabulous. But care must be had in the first place to observe the rules given by our great Lord and to walk according to them, and not for communion's sake to leap over the order Jesus Christ hath prescribed in His Word. And you can see where, obviously, He's, he's coming down on this issue. Uh, uh, there's no indication He didn't like Bunyan. He just felt that Bunyan's position undermined what he believed was the blueprint that he had found and other Baptist churches had found in the New Testament. Although Bunyan is currently one of the most celebrated Christian authors of the 17th century, in his own day he had little influence among his fellow Baptists. It's actually not until the 19th century that Bunyan gets rediscovered by the Baptists, and the Baptists are quick to own him as their own. And the 19th century becomes the critical time of the reprinting of Bunyan's works by many Baptist leaders. The years following the publication of this major work by Kiffin were difficult ones for him personally. His wife, Hannah, whom he had married in 1638, died on October the 6th, 1682. Kiffin remembered her this way. It pleased the Lord to take to himself my dear and faithful wife, with whom I had lived nearly 44 years, whose tenderness to me and faithfulness to God was such as cannot by me be expressed, as she constantly sympathized with me in my, all my afflictions. I can truly say I never heard her utter the least discontent under all the various providences that attended me, either me or her. She eyed the hand of God in all our sorrows, so as constantly to encourage me in the ways of God. Her death was the greatest sorrow to me that ever I met with in the world. He'd had two sons predecessor, William, the eldest, had died at the age of 20 at the close of August 1669. Another son had died in Venice. Kiffin was convinced he'd been poisoned by a Roman Catholic priest. I'm not sure where he had the evidence for that, but that was what his belie he believed. A daughter, Priscilla, had also predeceased Hannah, his wife. She died in March of 1679 at the age of 24. In 1684, Kiffin was at once again arrested, this time in the aftermath of the Rye House plot, when various London radicals, and I think John Owen's implicated in that, right? There's, I think, good evidence that Owen was thinking about the that this was something that should be carried out. There was a plot to assassinate Charles II. And uh, Kiffin did not have direct links to that, but he was arrested nonetheless. One of his sons-in-law, Joseph Hayes, a banker, narrowly escaped being executed after being wrongly implicated in the plot. Probably the sharpest blow after the death of his wife was yet to come, though, what Kiffin called no small affliction. Charles II died in 1685. His brother, the Roman Catholic James II, succeeded to the throne. A good number of people, particularly dissenters and Protestants, believed that James Scott, the first Duke of Monmouth, and he is an illegitimate, he's one of 11 illegitimate children of Charles II, and the eldest, he, they believed that he should be the king. And in fact, a rebellion was fomented down in what is called the West Country, which is western, southwestern England, Especially in, especially in uh, Wiltshire, Somerset, Dorset. And he began to build an army and was marching on initially Bristol. He's going to take Bristol and then march on London. But the king was able to meet him at a place called the Battle of Sedgemoor. And he was utterly defeated. A good number, in fact, it's one of the things I'm interested in writing about sometime, a good number of Baptist ministers and Baptists were in Monmouth's army. And some of them were subsequently hung. Two of them were the grandsons of William Kiffin, William and Benjamin Hewling. Both were apprehended after the failure of the rebellion and tried and executed in September of 1685. William at Lyme Regis in Dorset on September the 12th, Benjamin at Taunton in Somerset on September the 30th. Kiffin unsuccessfully sought to obtain their freedom by offering 3,000 pounds for their acquittal. And remember, that's 30 times an annual salary. No, sorry. That's a hundred, that's 
I'm not good at math. That's 100 times your annual salary. That's, a, that's an enormous amount of money. At the sentencing of William Hewling, the judge, George Jeffries, we've come across him before. He was the one who wanted to thrash uh, and whip uh, B- Baxter. Publicly told Kiffin. Kiffin was in the courtroom. Uh, he said this to Hewling, though, but Kiffin was there. You have a grandfather who deserves to be hanged as richly as you. Kiffin later had the opportunity to tell the king, James II, the death of his two grandsons was a wound to my heart, quote, which never will close but in the grave. Within three years of Monmouth's rebellion, James's regime crumbled in the Glorious Revolution of 1688. This is when uh, the Anglican clergy in England are fed up with having a Roman Catholic king. They're afraid if he has an heir, it'll be a Roman Catholic kingdom. And so they invite the, uh, William of Orange, a Dutchman, but he is uh, James's, uh, sorry, James II's son-in-law. He's married to his daughter Mary uh, to come across and become the king. And he lands on a very significant day, November the 5th, which is Guy Fawkes Day, if you know anything about English history. And uh, Guy Fawkes was the guy who was caught trying to blow up the House of Parliament in the early 1600s, and it became a celebrated day. Uh, uh, b- a very interesting Baptists. Uh, the, there were the, the only two holidays or the only two days of rest they encouraged in the year were always the Lord's Day. That's mandated in his word. They are generally Sabbatarian. And November the 5th. November the 5th was always a holiday that the Baptists took. They would not celebrate Christmas, Easter, or any others. As one of them, one of them said, that was, they were just bu- bu- dung from Baal. Uh, but they always celebrated November the 5th because that was the day... King William landed and brought freedom. Yeah, he staged the coup d'etat the following year of William. Now William III authorized the act of toleration. Again, he's coming from Holland. Holland is a haven of toleration. He brings very, very different ideas about the state church with him and sees them enacted in England. And he gave the dissenters religious freedom. As the 18th century Baptist Benjamin Wallen later commented, the Most High sent the glorious King William III and saved us. Kiffin, along with other Baptist leaders in London, employed the freedom of this new era to issue a call in July of 1689 for a National Assembly of Calvinistic Baptists, the first ever of its kind. Representatives from over 100 churches gathered, amongst other things, they approved the adoption of the Second London Confession of Faith, originally drawn up in 1677 by William Collins and E.M.I. Cox. This confession has been rightly described as the most influential and important of all Baptist confessions. And the second name on the list of those who gave their formal approval to it was Kiffin who signed for the church that he pastored at Devonshire Square in London. The Baptist unity experience at the assembly was short-lived, however, for in the 1690s, the London Baptist community, mostly the London, but others as well, was rent by a controversy, this time over the singing of hymns. Kiffin found himself drawn into the controversy in which he stridently opposed the singing of hymns in favor of the singing psalms only. We're not the first. We've had worship wars over the last little while. We're not the first. Uh, to go through that. It's very helpful to go back to the past and to see how others sometimes were wrong and how we can learn from their mistakes. Uh, Probably many of us would probably side against Kiffin in this, but not be that as it may. In the final years of his life, Kiffin also remarried. His second wife, Sarah, though, uh, soon soon ran afoul of her husband's congregation. It, It was a sad second marriage. On March 2nd, 1698, she was charged by the congregation with a number of misdeeds. Upon examination, she was found guilty of, among other things, defrauding her husband of 200 pounds, making false accusations about him. When she refused to appear before the church, Sarah was suspended from communion on April the 24th, 1698. Remember, he's the pastor. To add sorrow upon sorrow, Kiffin's third son, Harry, passed away on December the 8th, 1698. The Baptist patriarch himself died on December the 29th, 1701, and was buried in Bunhill Fields, where John Owen is. And is Richard Baxter buried there? No. Okay. Uh, Kiffin, Bowen's grave is still observable. You can still find it. Uh, Kiffin's, I think, has disappeared. One 19th century writer, Robert Southey, aptly described Bunhill Fields, about 120,000 Baptists. Presbyterians and Quakers were buried there and Congregationalists. He described it once as, quote, the Campo Santo, the holy ground of the dissenters. If you ever go to London, you have to go to Bunhill Fields. It's, it's a double treat because right opposite is John Wesley's house. So you get to 
You have to do the two things. From the 1640s, now summing up, till his death, at the beginning of the next century, William Kiffin was a source of strength and stability of the Calvinistic Baptist movement, played a vital role in its growth and advance. It was during his years of leadership of the movement that those positions distinctive of Calvinistic Baptists were hammered out. Congregational church government, believers' baptism, and a strong commitment to evangelical Calvinism and the planting of churches. Kiffin thus had no small part in the determination of the future identity of this Christian tradition. Seven years before his death in 1694, Kiffin wrote a foreword, also one in the, the little book we, we prepared for today, for the third edition of Baptism Discovered Plainly and Faithfully According to the Word of God by his fellow Baptist, John Norcott. In it, Kiffin noted that Norcott was a man who, quote, steered his whole course by the compass of the Word, making Scripture precept or example his constant rule in matters of religion. Other men's opinions or interpretations were not the standard by which he went, but through the assistance of the Holy Spirit, he labored to find out what the Lord himself had said in his word. It was these very things that Kiffin most admired about Norcott, his biblicism and reliance upon the Holy Spirit to illuminate Scripture that had also been absolutely central to his own life, thought, and piety. Well, we have maybe five minutes for questions, and then we'll break for, for, for lunch. Okay, so the, the first question was uh, the difference between the First London Confession and the Second London Confession seems to portray a growth in uh, theological ability, etc. Um, the Second London Confession is the Westminster Confession from 1646, uh, as it was mediated through the Congregationalist Confession and the Savoy Declaration of 1658. Uh, there are significant changes but they're not beginning afresh. The 1646 confession was drawn up by men, all of whom had a university education, all of whom would have gone to Oxford or Cambridge, would have had uh, a training in the languages, Greek, Latin. They would have had maybe some Euro European languages. They would have read all of the various divines of that, of that era in those languages. And they would have had a thorough grounding in the church fathers and uh, classical Christian theology. And so the Second London Confession, if, if you see it as significantly different, and I'm not necessarily sure it is, but uh, it is grounded in, it, the, the, the bulk of it is still written by those men. There are, there are significant changes. And if you go online, you can actually find, I think there's a website, it's got the Westminster Confession, the Savoy, and then the Second London Confession, and you can readily see the changes that have been made. Um, and so there, if, if there is an evidence that there is significant difference in terms of uh, theological ability, it, it's definitely owing to that. But I'm not sure there is that evidence, but if there is, that's that. The second is, what is the dominant kind of perspective of Baptists in the latter period in terms of, is it the regular principle or the covenant theology? Is that the question? Um, I think you have a number of things. Uh, they're definitely, they grow up in a Puritan world. They're Puritans. Uh, I, I take great umbrage at, you know, the way, well, not great umbrage, but I take some umbrage at the fact that Calvinistic Baptists have kind of not been part of the recovery in the last 40 years. They've been kind of sidelined. They were all Puritans. That's where they heard the faith. That's where they were mentored. 
That's their, that's their ethos. That's their theology. That's why Baptist life today, you, to understand it, it's, it's Puritan. It's, it's rooted and grounded in the Puritans. It's not rooted and grounded in the Anabaptists at all. Um, so having said that, um, you have a number, so it's not surprising that covenant theology, which was a major part of Puritan thought, at least many Puritans, is there. It's evident there. The regular principle is all the way back to Calvin. Calvin, in his commentary on Daniel, I forget which, which uh, uh, sermon, uh, basically says that, you know, God requires us to do nothing in worship but what is not required in His Word. That, becomes, that, beca- that is the heart of the Puritan quarrel with the Elizabethan church and then the Stuart church. Uh, the, 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 what becomes known as the Anglican Church. If it's not forbidden in God's Word, then it's allowable. The Puritans' argument is, no, no, we have to have, we have, to have Scripture precept for this. And so, uh, the, the, the Baptists are simply arguing Scripture precept is we baptize only believers. And so, the regular principle is, is strong. Um, that's, picked up, that's picked up in that last quote. That's what he's arguing. He, he made the Scriptures his, his rule. And that, 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 that's a constant. It runs right through Kiffin's life. It runs through a lot of these men. Uh, that's, his, that's his big quarrel bunion. You know, his quarrel bunion is, um, well, I won't. I'll, I'll leave that to Dr. Weaver. <laughs> but that, that is, that's absolutely central to his quarrel bunion. So the question was, why, if Kiffin was so active in his lifetime, is being completely forgotten? Well, if you don't produce a significant body of literature, it, it, it's very difficult for later generations to access you. Uh, I think he is the dominant shaper of Baptist life in this period, uh, without a doubt. Um, but if you don't have that, and he doesn't. He's only got Sober Discourse of Right to Church Communion. It's never reprinted. Um, he's got all of these prefaces. None of them are ever reprinted. The only thing that's ever reprinted is the First London Confession, which he writes the preface. I think he writes that confession. I think if you want a good insight into his theology, you see it there. Uh, he writes it, I think, with John Spilsbury. Um, I think that's critical. It's, it's very interesting in the, in the 18th century, very few of the Baptist works of the 17th century were reprinted. Uh, there is an attempt, and I think there is a realization by the 19th century nonconformists, particularly the Baptist, that Kiffin is important. There are two biographies that are published within 10 years of each other, uh, one in 1823 by William Orme, and then the one in 1833 by Joseph Ivamy. And then uh, in, the 19th, in the late 19th century, after the, what we call the Down Creek Controversy, uh, a lot of Baptists begin to lose interest in history. And uh, the 20th century... Uh, with the recovery, like in the 1960s, of uh, the Banner of Truth and their recovery of Owen. Uh, the Banner of Truth was a Presbyterian uh, publishing house, and uh, we're deeply thankful for what they've done in the recovery of a lot of this material. Uh, but by and large, the, they didn't publish uh, Baptists. Uh, they published uh, Bunyan, uh, Octavius Winslow, uh, who if you ever look at any of his the, the blurbs about him, it, it's, you don't realize he was a Baptist. He's described as a nonconformist, a Victorian nonconformist. Um, and so I think there are probably a, good, uh, probably a good number of reasons. I think a lot of it is simply he didn't write much. And he's, a, he's, a, he's an activist. He's, he's a church planter. He's, he's a pastor. And he's very involved, obviously, in his business affairs. <coughs> Any other questions before we, maybe one last question before we close? If not, I'll close us with a word of prayer and thanksgiving for the food we're about to partake. Any last questions? Yeah, there's, I don't think, I, yeah, the question was, uh, did uh, Kiffin's wealth and therefore his, ab- his ability to avoid direct imprisonment affect his reputation after his death? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I, 
I mean, the, the story by Thomas Crosby, the Thomas, Thomas Crosby story, which is like the 1730s, that's like the next generation after his death. Uh, that's kind of a, you know, they, they're, they're kind of relating this as a fun story. Yeah. You know, we actually had somebody who was so wealthy, you know, the king uh, wanted to borrow money from him, and he gave him a gift, and he saved himself 30,000 pounds, and kind of, a, yeah, it's brilliant, you know. We lowly Baptists actually have some money, you know. Um, I don't think it. I don't think that. I don't think that affected his reputation uh, going forward. There's no indication of it. Um, I mean, e- even though he didn't experience persecution, he experienced the the his experience. Even though his experience of persecution was milder than, say, Baxter or Bunyan, it nonetheless was real. And many of his friends died in and those prisons like Newgate, etc. So, Well, we will uh, close, uh, stop at this point. I will lead us in prayer. Uh, for those of you who are uh, uh, registrants, all you need is your uh, lanyard to uh, access the cafeteria downstairs. Uh, we'll resume at 3 o'clock uh, over in the Legacy Center uh, where we will have uh, uh, the parallel sessions uh, the, sign, the, the signs of which sessions are in which room are posted on the door. It's on the third floor, uh, rooms 303, I think, and 310. Uh, so we'll look forward to seeing you then. Let me uh, close the morning in prayer and give thanks to God for our food. Our God, we bless you for this morning. Thank you for the privilege of remembering the past in the way that we have done. We do pray that it would both be instructive and also inspirational and edifying. And we thank you also for taking care of not only our spiritual and intellectual needs, but also our physical needs. Thank you for food and for the meal that we're about to partake. And to you be given thanks and praise. And all this for Jesus' sake. Amen.